Okay, so Philippians chapter 2, we'll continue on with our look at that letter from Paul to the church at Philippi. Uh, and remember again, Paul's writing this from his prison cell. Uh, and it's often referred to as the joy letter in the New Testament. That's a recurring theme throughout the book of Philippians. As we went through chapter 1, you can see where the, the origins that joy lay. It, lay in the fa- or it lays in the fact that Paul is certain that no matter what takes place, God is at work for the good of those who love him. And that's a phrase we often bandy about kind of quickly without thinking about it. Uh, It doesn't mean that Paul will get out of prison, to use his example. It doesn't mean that he won't be executed in prison, to use his example. He wasn't at this imprisonment. He was in his next one. But when Paul could say things like he wrote in the book of Romans and really is applying in Philippians as well, that God's at work working all things together for the good of those who love him. He even said in chapter 1, if that means God taking me to heaven now and my life on this side of eternity ends, better by far was his conclusion. Yet I want to do what God's will might be. Uh, And so his goal was to communicate to the people at Philippi, and, and obviously God's working a bitter goal, a bitter, bitter goal, that's not right, bigger goal, not bitter, but bigger, goal uh, for us a couple of thousand years later to help us know the, the, the joy that Paul talks about in chapter 1. And remember, that joy is really defined as a calm kind of delight. It's not an up and down feeling, but it's a calm, even keel confidence or delight that, that God is indeed at work and I'm going to rest in his hands. Now, that can lead us to some struggles. The end of chapter 1, in verse 29, for instance, Paul shared, you know, it's been granted to you, you people at Philippi, you Christian people there, on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him or trust in him, but also to suffer for him. Now, it's an interesting kind of a phrase to our way of thinking. It's been granted to you also to suffer for him, as though that's a privilege. Well, Paul would say it is a privilege. Uh, And if you stop and really think about it, and and here's where there's often a disconnect for Christians in North America, where quite honestly, we've had it so good for so long, everybody experiences hard things. Let me say that from the get-go. Everybody does, and I don't mean to downplay that for a second. But the kind of suffering that 80% of the population of the world knows on a daily basis, it's not even on our radar. Uh, uh, And so... You know, to, for us, there's a bit of a disconnect, but maybe a way of reconnecting is to remember that we're talking relationship terms here. And let me ask you, if there is someone you really love, are you willing to put things on the line for that person? Yeah, right? I mean, that's how we express love. To say I love you and do nothing about it when you need help with something, it's kind of empty. But to say, I love you, and then act on that basis, okay, A, we can understand that, and B, would you say, would it be fair to say it's a privilege to show that person they matter by doing something that's hard for them? You know, when you really think of it in the purest logical sense, it is a privilege to show that person they are of value to you. And that's the kind of thing behind verse 29. Does Jesus matter to me? Am I ready to put things on the line for him? Picture the Savior a couple, well, the night, a couple of nights before he was crucified uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. And remember some of his prayer there, you know, Father, if there's any other way, let's do it another way. Yet not what I want, but your will be done. And I'm ready to go to the cross. I know what's coming. I know it's suffering hell. But there's Jesus, you know, both fully human and fully God at the same time. And we're not going to try and dissect how that can be because that's above us. When we come to understanding the mind of God, we kind of have to come to a full stop and say, yeah, that's bigger than me. But here's Jesus, fully God and fully human. And what did he do in his fully human nature? He kept going back to his father. When he got busier and busier, he made sure he had time to be away with his father in heaven to be strengthened for the tasks at hand. And then he was able to look at even the hard things in a way that's a privilege. Now, chapter 2 in Philippians really gets into detail on some of those hard things and why Jesus saw it as a privilege. 
Uh, and then it's a reminder for us of what we en- read at the end last time, in the last verse of chapter 1, that this is also a privilege for us if there are struggles that come because we belong to him. Since you are, verse 30, going through the same struggle you saw that I, Paul, had, and now here I still have. But he's already reminded them that the struggle he had and still has is doing good things for the eternity of many people. Other people have come to know there's a savior for them. And and that's the other element to bring into the mix. If I might face something that's hard for me to face, but that something results in somebody else having eternal life, Am I going to be so self-centered to say that wasn't worth it? Don't answer yes to that, please. <laughs> I hope I'm not going to be that self-centered. You get what I'm saying, right? Uh, and, and that's kind of what's behind Paul at the end of chapter 1 leading into chapter 2. So uh, let's see. Did I miss anything major here? Uh, so the goal then is to live in that kind of certainty that Paul knows that whatever happens, God's got me in his hands and his will is to work things for my best as well. God doesn't cause evil or bad things in this world, but he doesn't waste them either. I heard somebody say that recently, and I really like that phrasing. God doesn't cause bad things to happen, but when people, because of their own free will and sinful nature, do bad things, God doesn't waste them. Uh, And he's going to use them for good for those who love him. And if part of my struggle with hard things teaches me that God is faithful, especially in the hard times, that's a good lesson for me to learn as well, aside from the benefit it might have for other people. So all those ideas are kind of mixed together in what we're talking about. Uh, We pick up with chapter 2 today on that basis. Uh, And um, yeah, let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence here with us. Uh, You're always there, but sometimes we lose that focus. Help us to remember that because of your faithfulness, because of your unchanging character, we have a certain hope in which we live here and now. And then help us to be people who live in a way that reflects that certainty to those around us. We ask this that we would give glory to you, but also that we would be people who live in the kind of peace that does pass human understanding. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, and maybe that helps us kind of frame up what we're talking about in chapter 2, that passage from... um uh, from scripture that, that talks about, you know, when you're, the, your, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. It's from Peter, and I think we read it last Sunday. Uh, or is it this Sunday? I get my Sundays mixed up. Um, it was either last week's sermon or this week's sermon. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but the peace that passes human understanding comes from a, when you're anxious, not if, when you're anxious, Come to God with thanksgiving. Remember his character, who he is. He does not change. He will not deny himself or his nature. And remembering who he is and what he's done for you because of that nature, present your requests to God with thanksgiving because he doesn't change. And that's when the peace of God that passes human understanding literally pursues you, is the way the text puts it. Uh, So it doesn't just come out of the blue, and and I think that's something that that we need to be cognizant of too. Oh, I don't feel God's peace. I'm just kind of sitting here waiting for it. Well, talk to him about that. And talk to him remembering who he is, and with thanksgiving, it'll start to come through to you. That's kind of the setting for what we're reading here as well. So chapter 2 begins with an assumption. If you leave, or sorry, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, you know, It's an assumption, right? The answer is you do have this. Uh, And some of your Bibles probably include the word. It is there in the original, and and I wish the NIV that I'm reading would have included it too. If you therefore have any encouragement, if any comfort. And the therefore is important, I think, because that tells you it's based on what came before, right? And what came before is everything I was trying to do by way of review. God will not deny himself. His nature doesn't change. He has been with Paul. He'll continue to be with Paul. Paul even has some evidences of how he's at work in the middle of Paul's suffering. That whole palace guard knows about Jesus now. But when that evidence isn't as clear, it doesn't mean God isn't still at work. Because while he doesn't cause the hard things in the world, he doesn't waste them either. He's working things together for the good of those who love him. So... um, This translation, the Passion Translation, 
Yeah. Because look at how much encouragement you found in your relationship with the anointed one. Okay, and I like that. That's a nice, easy reading way of getting the idea of cross. Just take a hard look at what is real. Uh, remember what Jesus said, if you, if you trust in me, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Remember that word truth there literally is reality. You'll know reality and the reality I bring you will set you free. That's the kind of thing that this is talking about here. Uh, when there's hard things, Jesus has overcome the world. That's what he said in John 16. In this world, you'll have trouble. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So all that's behind us. So yeah, and I guess what I could say to kind of paraphrase what I'm reading, because you have encouragement from being united with Christ. And that makes me think, really? Oh yeah. Oh, if I think it through, yeah, I guess I do. Uh, and so, you know, you have to go through that mental process sometimes. Because you have comfort from his love, because you have fellowship with his spirit, because you have his tenderness and compassion that he's shown to you. You know, so all the if so is replacing with because. Uh, but, you know, it gets the idea across. Verse 2, then make, then do something with it. Then make my joy complete, how? By being A, like-minded, and we'll come back to these, B, having the same unconditional agape love. C, being one in spirit and purpose. So three things which kind of flow together. And it started out with, by, make my joy complete by being like-minded. That's hard for human beings, isn't it? You know, anytime you get a group of people in a room, you got a group of different opinions, right? But what Paul's getting at here isn't that you shouldn't have different opinions. But when, as a Christian group, you're making decisions or looking at the future or seeking out where you find your confidence and hope, you talk about the things that are on your mind. You discuss the things that are worrying you. You go over what the, the mights that might be outcomes could be and why you're worried about that. And you build up each other in confidence knowing that because we're seeking to serve the Lord God here, there isn't a right and wrong way to do this, but he would want us to be united in doing it. Uh, and we can go forward in confidence then. And he's going to use that. And it's not as though, you know, I'll go back to one of my, my standard uh, examples again. It's not as though we're pr praying, oh God, if you can do something, I hope you do something, but I don't know if you will. And that's kind of how I feel about a lot of well, let me ask you, do you feel that way about a lot of people who make promises to you in your life sometimes? You know, there's some people you really trust and other people, you know, they make promises and you kind of think, yeah, yeah, okay, whatever. God's not like that. And so we don't have to come with the whining out loud prayers. We can come with the, okay, Father, you know, here's, this is really worrying me. And I know you know it. Here's what, I'm going to try to do. I think it's best. Here's what we as a group have decided to try. We think it's best. Please guide us. Please be at work among us. And then you just take a step of confidence and you do something. And, and what does God do? He shows up. Not because you're being so perfect, but because you're present. And that's the other idea I wanted to remind you of from last week. Whether it's our prayers or our life of faith or whatever, God's not so concerned about you being perfect as he is about you being present. Have you ever had a decision to make and you weren't sure what the right thing was to do? And you prayed till you were blue in the face and God still didn't put up a billboard and tell you what the quote-unquote right thing to do was? So what did you end up doing? Well, you're a grown-up, so you had to do something. Okay? You sought God's will. You wanted to please his heart. You were present. I can promise you God will work with that decision. Qualifier, unless it was totally against the word of God. <laughs> so if your, if your prayerful decision was to go and murder someone, chances are pretty decent that that's not within the will of God, right? So what I'm getting at is assuming that you're trying to follow what's clear in Scripture. Okay. So... The first thing is being like-minded and having the same unconditional agape love and being one in spirit and purpose. And that's what we've been talking about, right? We want to give glory and honor to God. And, and there's the rub, especially when groups of people, Christian or not, get together. 
Everybody's got their own agenda. Everybody's got their, their own things that really speak to their heart and are important to them. And none of what I'm saying makes any of those more or less valuable. But sometimes it's hard to sacrifice those things, isn't it? What we need to be always asking ourselves, and this is what Paul's going to get at in the example of Christ in the verses that come in five and following, is am I ready to put others before me? This is what he's leading up to. Remember in chapter 1 he said that he, his prayer was that they would know and share in the love of Christ. What was his love like? He didn't say, here's what I want first. He sought the Father's will and he worked for the good of people, us. He put us first because that was his role in the Father's plan. And that doesn't mean he did everything we want, right? He was putting our eternal well-being first and what he knew was best was first for us. And you know where that took him? That took him to injustice, injustice rather, that took him to beatings, that took him to the cross, that took him to suffer hell itself. But he was willing to do that. So having that love being one in spirit and purpose, am I ready because God is unchanging and faithful to put others ahead of me? I should be. And that's a constant question for each one of us to ask ourselves. You know, what's, what's, how will they benefit if I put myself on the line here? And I should be willing to do that sometimes, shouldn't I? Please understand, none of this is about what we would think of as abusive relationships and unhealthy boundaries. It's not about that. It's okay for Christians to have healthy boundaries too. God did not call us to be the doormats of the world. Jesus himself said, you know, if you're, if you're talking to people about me and, and they keep on saying no, 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 there comes a point where you just shake the dust off your feet and move on. Uh, but the first place we shouldn't go is my desire and comfort first. I should have the mind of Christ, which was considering, and this is where we're going in chapter 2, how does this impact the people in the sphere of my influence? And that is a countercultural thought, isn't it? Um, all right, so being one uh, in spirit and purpose. Then he goes on, verse uh, 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition, self-interest, or vain conceit. What I get and my, my uh, what, uh, image and me, I'm more important than anything. Um, but in humility, NIV has consider others better than yourselves. More significant is a more literal translation. And I like that because when I read better than yourselves, it kind of puts a value judgment on it. As though somehow, you know, they're more important to God or because they're doing a better job or something. There's a value attached to a word like better and it shouldn't be there. More significant. I should be looking at others as though they matter, in other words. And um, that makes sense, doesn't it? And yet it's hard. It makes sense, and yet it's hard. And it's hard in a culture that more and more seems to be moving in a different direction than that. Uh, and, you know, so that's an area of life where we might at times have to just bite our tongues and, and try to be people who listen an awful lot before we speak. Um, but, but the point is that we're, we're treating people as though they are significant and as though they matter, and we're not worrying about self-promotion. Why? Well, do I need to worry about my eternal well-being before the living God? No, because Jesus has looked after that already. So if I'm set free from that worry, and if I can keep cognitively reminding myself of that truth and building on God's faithfulness because that's true and He doesn't change, then I'm more free to be someone who takes a deep breath and has time for another person, who's willing to listen to them, uh, and, and you know, try and meet them where they're at, which is a, really what everyone in the world is looking for, isn't it? Someone to just meet me where I'm at. Is, let me let you in on a secret. 
It's not a secret at all, but I'll let you in on it anyway. Everybody in the world is desperately insecure. Everybody in the world, in their heart of hearts, thinks if these people out there really knew everything that's going on inside of me, they would desert me. Everybody in the world thinks that to one degree or another. But remind yourself that God knows that and he loves you more than you can possibly imagine. And he's done something about that. And so you're set free from that need for self-promotion, which is really what Paul's getting at here. Instead, uh, well, let's just go on. Each of you, uh, let's see, so consider in humility, consider others more significant than yourselves. Is humility a bad thing? No, not biblically at all. Um, I should come before God with great humility. Uh, and there I receive everything I need for the best life possible. But if I come before God with great arrogance, I'm going to miss the boat on a lot of what he has to offer. It's when I come to him with empty hands that he fills everything up. Uh, because that's what he made me for, to keep pouring out his blessing upon me, his blessing upon you. But sometimes we have our deflector shields up. Anybody watch Star Trek or things like that? Captain, are the deflector shields happening? Uh, you know, it's like our, our spiritual deflector shields are up and we're bouncing God's blessing off of us because we're trying to do it on our own and in our own way. Um, sorry for that really bad Scottish accent there. Uh, all right, so verse 4. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. How? Okay. Verse 5. Here's how. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now, again, that's nice, easy reading, the way the NIV has it there. But more literally, and I think there's value in understanding, have this mind in you which is yours in Christ Jesus, is more literal. Why do I think there's value in knowing that? If I just say to you, your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus, who have I put the pressure on? You, right? If I say to you, have this mind in you which is already yours in Christ Jesus, some of the pressure has now been deflected in an appropriate way this time because it's talking about something that already exists in you. And what is that something, God the Holy Spirit, who's at work inside of you through the Scripture, renewing and recharging and reforming and refreshing and molding and shaping your heart and mind and being? And when you understand that, then you understand something so significant. You're not alone. It's not a command that says, you try harder. It's a statement of reality that says, remember whose hands you're in. And act like it. Okay? Um, do you rem do you, did you ever experience a time as a teenager maybe, where you wondered if anybody in the world really liked you. Um, and you know, we probably all went through ups and downs in our lives. I'm picking on teenagers here because there's none of them in the room and they can't fight back right now. And, uh, and also because, you know, it, it, it is kind of a common experience for kids to go through, will anyone like me, love me, blah, blah, blah. But I can remember never, ever, ever doubting that there was a place where I was accepted no matter what because I, I was blessed with a solid, stable home with some people who loved me there. And, and whether it's a mother or a father, and, and not everybody was blessed with having good examples of that, I understand. But I'm just using my background as an example here. I had a place where I always was safe. And that's what we're meant to be for each other as a Christian community a place where we're safe. That's what God provides for us through his word, a place where we're safe. And that's the mind of Christ being at work in you, that you're held. And if you're safe, you're better prepared to be someone looking out for the, what did it say in verse four? Uh, the interests of others, okay? All right, so have this mind in you. It'll help you look out for the interests of others. So what was Jesus like then? Well, it's described, he's described in verse 6 and following. Who being in very nature God, and the vocabulary is very specific, he's God, period. He's of the same essence and being as God, okay? 
did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, pursued is the idea behind it. So he is God, therefore he is equal with God, right? But that wasn't his banner he was waving around all the time. That's not what he was pursuing. He could have. He had every right to. But that's not what he pursued. Right? So going back to verse 4 again. Looking also to the interests of others. All right. I'm starting to get what that means from a Jesus point of view. Uh, instead, verse 7, he made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And just pause and let that wash around your head a little bit. The almighty creator being who's so far above us, we can't begin to grasp Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at the same time, was willing to become one of his creation. That's kind of mind-blowing to begin with. And yet I know this is true because when I look at the life of Jesus, there is no way he wasn't absolutely unique in this world. The things he could do, the things he knew, the powers he had, the bits of divinity that he showed, even in his human nature, there's something going on there. So the maker, the almighty creator being, became one of his creatures so that his creatures could abuse him and treat him horribly so that he could suffer and die eternal separation for them huh he made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness that's what all that holds within it so what's the mind of christ like it is loving beyond measure and committed to you and me beyond measure we can say that safely, can't we? Uh, and then verse 8, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And the emphasis there, they would get better than we. Even death on a cross, you know, reading the Old Testament as they were well versed in it, uh, to, to, to uh, be publicly displayed by hanging on a tree or a cross, that was a sign of being cursed by God was their thinking. That was their cultural thinking. It wasn't God's command. That was just their cultural thinking. So Jesus steps into our world, steps into the culture, and takes on a sign of that culture that says, I'm cursed by God. Is it safe for us to say there's truth behind that when Jesus says from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah. It's like us like us humans, and then takes on things that we don't have to experience because of what he did. To be forsaken by the Father. God is with you now. I know there's times in life when it feels like he's far away, and yeah, the cliche is who moved, we did. Yeah, I get that. I still know there's times in life where he feels far away. Jesus wasn't feeling feelings. Jesus was dealing with reality. The Father turned away from him. He was far away. Jesus knew that was going to happen going into it, yet he did it willingly. Why? That's the value he placed on you. He wanted you to know about that, and he wanted you to know his love today. And I want to emphasize that. Because I think sometimes, okay, I'll, maybe it's just my experience. You know, I, I don't know a day in my life when I didn't know Jesus was my Savior. But I know a ton of days in my life when I took that so for granted I acted like it didn't matter to me. You know what I'm saying? Because it's always been a part of my experience. So in spite of that truth, Jesus wants me to know today how much he values me. Do I deserve that? In no way. And I doubt if I'm the only one in the room of whom that's true. <laughs> But I will freely confess that about me, because it is true. Uh, and, and yet, here we've got an example again, where it even emphasizes, you know, he was willing to have God turn his face away. 
for, for you and for me. So don't, don't let me leave you. I know you know already, but don't let me leave you with Jesus saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What else did he say when he hung on the cross? It is finished. Accounting term from the day, paid in full. The debt is absolutely wiped out. It's paid. So the times that I treated him like he didn't matter, was that paid for? Yeah. The times that I will mess up, you know, tomorrow, if tomorrow comes, was that paid for? Yeah. So am I on solid footing knowing the love of the Almighty God no matter what? Yeah. But man, do I need to keep reminding myself of that. And that's what chapter 2 is about. If that's true, then here's what you ought to do with it is what we're going for here, okay? All right, so verse 9, therefore, you know, what was the result here? Jesus did all this willingly. Therefore, uh, because he allowed himself to be cut off from God, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the, knee of Je- sorry, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's where the ultimate goal, and that's where the ultimate glory goes. That's the ultimate goal there, is to give glory to God the Father. But because Jesus went to that garden, said, not my will, but yours be done. Here, Father, I, if there's any other way, please take this from me, but I want your will to be done. And willingly continued on with that plan of the Father, said, experienced being forsaken by God, and ultimately paid for our sin and said, it is finished, and rose again, showing he defeated death. Therefore, God exalted him. And, and this isn't exalted in the sense that, oh, he did a really good thing, so now God's giving him a reward. This is the natural outcome, and that's really important to understand. Because death is defeated, the natural outcome is Jesus, the defeater, the victor over death, is raised up because God the Father's plan is followed and all glory goes to God. That's the ultimate goal, for us to enjoy God in all His glory. That's what He created us to experience. And it's good beyond measure. And we lose sight of that. And how many times have, oh, i got to keep confessing. How many times have I lived for my own glory? How many times have you? How many times have we pursued things that, that just we want, said, I'm just sick and tired of everybody else. I don't care. Okay, I get it. I've been there too. Uh, but at the same time, God took all of that in Jesus and he said, I love this guy enough. And I want him to know my glory and presence forever anyway. That's what he wants for you. So the, the, the fact that Jesus is exalted to the highest place is really good news that gives glory to God for at least two important reasons. There's probably way more, but let me just name two of you, two of them for you. Jesus is your Savior, right? So if your Savior is at the right hand of God, If the one who loved you enough to do everything I've just been describing for you is at the right hand of God, do you think maybe you have God's ear in a good way? I think so. And second important reason is because that was God's plan all along and it honors and gives glory to his plan by raising it up as the most important thing. So the ultimate outcome is, is that God's plan is given honor and glory. And, and yeah, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And when he returns, that will happen quite literally. But right now, even now, we should be doing the same because he hasn't gone anywhere, has he? And so, you know, the encouragement here for Paul's readers is to, back to chapter 1, even in Paul's distress, God is good. God is at work. God is doing what God's always going to do, and that is working for the good of those who love him and for their salvation. He's done that for me, says Paul, and he wants to keep doing that for you, and I'm praying that you know that at a deeper and deeper level. Here's one way you can start to, to cognitively work towards understanding that and knowing it yourself. Remember who Jesus is, and remember that that same mind is God's gift to you. To see other people, you know, when I look around the room here today, I see people that Jesus loved enough to suffer hell for. That puts a really high value on all of you. And, um, and that's how we're to see each other and treat each other then, right? 
So there's, there's that kind of an assurance that we matter and that we can communicate to others that they matter too. Is that going to take things like humility? Yeah. Is that going to take things like considering others significant? Yep. Is that going to take things like showing I trust in the Lord God by even sacrificing maybe some of my preferences for the common good? Yep. Is that going to take all of those things and more? Yeah. But ultimately, what are we looking for here to reflect what God is like to the world around us? He's good. Okay. Yep. Mark, I was just going to say with Paul and he was Saul, and he was such a out rounding up Christians and and doing you know persecuting them, and then when God said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And I mean, he turned out to be this amazing witness hmm. for Jesus Christ, and through that. You know, at some point you must have thought, well, God's at me that one time pretty good. I better get it together here because I don't know what he's going to do. And I know yeah. it's so real. They yeah. had to touch him so profoundly. Can we call it a reality check? It was a big reality yeah. check. And I just think, you know, even someone that is hardened and did things, mm -hmm. and God said, you know what, I, I have a plan here. And I know what I'm going to do yeah. with it. So this zap I'm going to give you. And he always had the freedom to choose one mm -hmm. way or the other. But for three days, like he sat there and did nothing and had this, and then this, you know. Yep, you know, blind and yep. Blinded him and stuff. And I, I think, okay, even for him to turn around and, you know, say, okay, now I want to be one of you guys. Let me into the boys club. Yeah. They had to be a little cautious of him. And right? they were, weren't they? They, they were. They were very nervous at first. This is the guy who was killing the Christians, yeah. Right? So, and he turned out to be an amazing, yeah. you know, witness for, for Christ. So isn't that encouraging? Yeah. If God can take a guy like Paul and make him into the person that he used to author two-thirds of the New Testament, mm -hmm. that's pretty remarkable. Is there anyone I know that's beyond hope? I might feel that way sometimes, but it's never true, <laughs> right? Or let's make it more personal. Am I, don't answer this, please. Am I ever beyond hope? See Michelle going like this over there. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and so there's a real encouragement for us there, isn't there? Uh, and, and also in the sense of, like we were talking about it last week, the change in Paul's life is yet another reason to say, wow, something amazing happened there. Yeah. I think so, you know, Mm -hmm. If he would have died uh, going on to the cross, he could never have gone to his father again. No, he couldn't have. You know, thanks the ascension would not have been possible if he hadn't followed through on the plan, right? No. Yeah, no. yeah, fair enough. That's a big, heavy load. Yeah. Oh, we'll never imagine. Yeah. yeah another comment. We make so many limitations, too, on God, don't we? We think <laughs> the bird can do anything, we think, you know, yeah. with his help, yes. But he is almighty. I mean, he can do anything, like... Change Paul around. He could change anybody. Do anything, and yet we limit him so much. I'm glad you made that comment. Let me let me ask you this: Have you ever prayed for something that was really important, and and then thought to yourself, "Yeah, but God's not going to do it anyway." <laughs> I have, I have. So why am I limiting him there too? Shouldn't I rather say, you know, I said, "Your will be done." Here's what I think needs to happen, and then I said, "Your will be done." Shouldn't I trust He's going to do what's best? Because He's not limited by anything. Well. I was always taught, if you pray for something, believe that he's going to do it, or he won't. If you don't believe, because we need to have that connection with him and believe him. If you don't believe him, why would he do it? Well, he's there's... going to work in your heart until you do build that faith. But, you know, why ask for something if you think he's yeah. going to And that kind of belief and faith is always couched in the your will be done thinking too, right? So it's not a matter of you know me saying, oh, I believe these are the winning lottery numbers and they're going to be. Uh, you know, it's a matter of me saying, I believe you're going to do what's best for me because that's who you are. Uh, and we keep coming back to that, the character and the nature of God. He does not change, so we can count on that. Uh, so again, a great example of that, that I just heard somewhere recently, something I was listening to, uh, in the Gospel of John, and it was one of our readings a Sunday or so back as well, ask anything in my name and it will be done for you, Jesus says. And then a couple of chapters after that, he's in the garden praying, 
if there's any other way, take this from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. How do you put those two together? Well, the not my will, but yours be done. When Jesus said, ask anything in my name, he's talking to people who want God's name to be glorified. And knowing that, knowing that's the ultimate outcome, also trusts that we're going to be cared for in the process, so what's best for me will happen then as well, and so why wouldn't I want God's will to be done? You know, for the people I love, it's going to be best for them. Why wouldn't I want His will to be done? For the world around me, it's going to be best for that world. Why wouldn't I want His will to be done? How did Jesus teach His disciples to pray? Matthew 7, uh, the disciples see the help Jesus receives talking to His Father in prayer and say, teach us to pray, and so He teaches them the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. So Matthew 7 is one example of where that's found. And just think about that for a minute. Our Father who art in heaven. I, sorry, I have to do it in King James because that's how I learned it as a kid. Um, but, you know, again, none of us has been a perfect father. and Many of us have experienced very imperfect fathers. But all of us can wrap our minds to some degree around what would a perfect father be like who would always do what's best for you, who would always love you no matter what, who would always work for your good. This is our Father. And so Jesus taught us to pray by recognizing who we're talking to. And then how does it go after that? Hallowed be your name. You have to go back and say it, right? It's hard to jump in in the middle. <laughs> Hallowed be your name. His name is going to be holy if I ask for it or not, right? Because he is who he is. So who am I asking for God to help keep it holy? Me. May it be holy in me. And the same with your kingdom come and your will be done. It's going to happen. It's going to come whether I ask for it or not, but make it a part of my life and experience. So all of those are really saying, Father, I trust you. I want what you want because I know that'll be for my blessing as well. So yeah, it goes back to praying with that kind of confidence then, doesn't it? Good comment. All right, uh, how are we doing? We got a little time left. Therefore, verse 12, so... Um, uh, because all this is true of Jesus, because the Father's plan was honored, because God has given the glory, therefore, my dear friends, live like that's true. As you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Okay, let's cut, or sorry, break that down a little bit. First of all, therefore, obviously based on what came before, so just what we are talking about. God's character, His nature, He doesn't change. Therefore, because you have this solid footing, just as you have always listened attentively, NIV has obeyed. Uh, I'm not really convinced that's the best word to use there. Listen attentively is literally what it means. And, and I'm trying to get away from the idea of we got to be perfect again, because that's not what the text is saying. But we should be present. And listening attentively means that the one I'm listening to matters to me. Fair enough? So I'm present with that individual. Yeah. But we can never be perfect no. until we go to heaven. You know, and people think, I've got to get perfect or I've got to get better. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if you do better, you want to try to live a Christ-like life, yeah. but you'll never get perfect. I mean, if exactly. he wouldn't have had to die for us. <laughs> exactly. And so what I'm trying to avoid there is the idea that I'll never be good enough anyway, so I won't bother trying. Oh, yeah. And, and I know exactly what you're saying. You're exactly right. Uh, what sometimes in my experience happens, though, is people read a verse like that and say, oh, I better be more obedient because that's why things aren't going well in my life. Well, okay. Uh, if you are out uh, robbing 7-Elevens every night and you get arrested, maybe things are going bad in your life because you haven't been very obedient. Sure, I get that. But in the, the everyday nuts and bolts, the more, quote, normal things of life, God's not out to get you because you haven't been good enough. That's not how this works. So I'm trying to avoid that idea of obedience and instead relational, presence. Uh, I'm listening attentively because you matter to me. So that, that's maybe a better understanding. So now that you've done that, not only when in my presence, but also much more in my absence, basically he's saying continue to do it. You know, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling is not saying that you have to meet Jesus part way and he paid for part of your sins on the cross and you kind of finish up the job. No. What it is saying is you are on a journey of faith right now. 
And on your journey of faith, on my journey of faith, day by day by day, I come up against many crossroads and intersections uh, where I have to make choices and decisions. And, and those crossroads and intersections, my choices and decisions should be fueled by the certainty that God is real, that he loves me. And, and when they're not, and when I mess up, they should be fueled by the fact that I've gone back to the cross and said, you know, Jesus, I sure need you. And help me to give glory to you now by admitting that I messed up, thanking you for your forgiveness, and moving on in a better direction. So what it's pointing back to, again, is God's grace, right? To his goodness to us. That's what working out our salvation is referring to. But in order to do that, it kind of has to be on your mind, doesn't it? And remember I said a minute ago, there are some times where I've kind of acted like God was a thousand miles away, just because I'm so used to him being there all the time. That's when I'm forgetting to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. And that's when I'm forgetting that my adversary, the devil, First Peter, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And that's when I'm setting myself up to, to deflect God's grace and his goodness to me and to kind of try and go life on my own a little bit more. And that never works out too well. That never, ever works out too well. I'm always the loser when I do that. So working out your salvation really means keeping Jesus front and center. My need for him, the fact that he's there, the truth that he doesn't change because God is constant and unchanging. And why wouldn't I want to live like that's true? Because it's real. You know, keeping all that kind of front and center. Could I just simplify it by saying, by remember whose I am? You know, I belong to someone new. Uh, I've been made his own. You know, that's kind of what's behind it. Um, fear and trembling, again, not in the sense of living every li day of life afraid, but like this matters, like it's important. Uh, treating it like, like there's something really at stake here, because there is, you know, eternity. Um, and then a, a gospel reminder uh, follows right on the heels of that. And it's got to be you and I fixing our attention on, on our Lord because that's what verse 13 directly says. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So working out my salvation with fear and trembling has a lot to do with remembering who God is. He reached out to me. He found me in his goodness and grace. He keeps me close to him through his word. So wouldn't I be kind of, you know, to use my grandmother's word, a dumbkopf, <laughs> if I just ignored that word? If I treated it like it was unimportant and tried to go life on my own? That's what those verses are getting at. And can you see how that's tied together with verse 5? Have this mind in you which is yours in Christ Jesus. It's kind of a summary of the same statement. You know, the mind of Christ Jesus totally, completely understood. You know, we won't do it perfectly. That's not the point. He did it for us perfectly. But this is what we're striving towards. He totally and completely trusted in the will of his Father in heaven and sought it. And that should be my goal. I won't do it perfectly. Neither will you. It still doesn't make it a bad goal, does it? And that's what we're here to pursue. And as we do, we're practicing presence in God's... We're practicing being present before God. You know, perfection really isn't the issue, but being present before Him. Um, some more nuts and bolts examples of what that looks like follow. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that... Uh, sorry, I've got some notes to myself here. Um, so that you will be proven to be blameless and pure, children of God without fruit in a, sorry, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. It's one of Paul's long sentences, in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold uh, upon or to the word of life. I'm going to stop there for a second. A couple of, of NIV things again. Um, first one, verse uh, 15. Do everything without complaining so that you may become blameless. Well, first of all, the without complaining part. If I spend my life complaining, I am saying I know better and I'm being hard done by. Fair? 
If I complain before God, I'm telling him I know better and he's doing things wrong. Fair? Do you know what the most common sin mentioned in the Bible is? Grumbling. Grumbling. Yeah, because it shows discontent. I did a quick word search. Just in the Old Testament, it's over 100 instances. Uh, and it was a different word in the New Testament. There's about two or three of them, so I didn't have time to look it up. But, you know, so without complaining, remembers God's character again. And when I remember he's working for our good, okay, I can live in trust. Even if, you know, going back to the group scenario again, we decide something as a group that's not exactly the direction I would have gone. God's going to work with it anyway, and I can let that rest and be at peace. Because we're trying to do things that honor him. Have the trust. Have that trust, yeah. So it's got to do with that trust and that relationship. And then it goes on in verse 15, and I, I would say, so that you uh, may be proven to be blameless. Not become blameless as though you're going to become more and more perfect all the time. There is, as, as we were reminded earlier, nothing wrong with trying to do better, right? Please don't walk away from this and, and say the pastor said I should try and be worse. No. <laughs> but trying to be perfect, we won't get there this side of eternity, but to be proven to be faithful to God, be proven to be blameless and pure, that more fits giving God honor and glory. So at the end of all things, for instance, when Jesus returns and people uh, can see, oh, you were living that way as a Christian because you wanted other people to know about Jesus and his love for them. Oh, that's the kind of blamelessness and purity we're talking about here. Okay. Uh, uh, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, sounds really bad, but when you think about this, clearly... There's really no other alternative, you know, uh, to, what's an example? Okay, uh, again, without mentioning names, uh, I, I still, I've mentioned this before, I remember a big, big uh, public speaker event here in Calgary, this goes way back now, probably 10, 12 years, in the Saddle Dome, and this public speaker told the 20,000 people there, what's most important for you 20,000 people is that all of you follow your own heart. I'd be very afraid in that room because I don't trust everybody else's heart. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I get what the speaker is trying to say, and I'm not, again, trying to be overly critical. All I'm saying is that kind of thinking taken to its logical conclusion forgets that every person is struggling with the desire to play God and to be, a, to, to be God for themselves. And that's what the crooked and depraved generation is referring to. Okay. There's no way for that kind of person in and of themselves by their own power and goodness to find their way back to a holy and perfect God. So you shine like a light in that generation because in the middle of all my faults and flaws, you ever notice how I, I try very hard whenever I'm talking about faults and flaws to talk about me? <laughs> well, they stick out all over. Whenever... My faults and flaws stick out all over. If I can use even them to say, that's why I'm so happy I have a Savior, that's still shining like a light, isn't it? So that's what it's getting at there. Um, in which you shine like stars in the universe, end of verse 15, as you hold, and, and I get it, the NIV says, as you hold out the word of life in sort of an evangelism mindset, but the word is literally as you hold on to the word of life. Uh, and because that's the literal translation, I want to share it. And, be, and I think there's value in it because if I'm constantly just holding out the word of life, I'm a human being who's going to get tired and worn out and grumpy and grouchy and that sin's going to stick out all the more. But if I'm holding on to the word of life, there's a fighting chance. <laughs> because then it's the power of God working in you and me and that's what we need. Okay? So holding on to that, because it all depends on Jesus, is the point. Uh, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. Um, don't give up. For the people with whom you're trying to be an example of the gospel and share that good, don't give up. You're not doing it for nothing. God's at work there. 
He said his word doesn't return to him void. You may not see the results that you want when you want them. None of us does, typically. Sometimes God blesses you with that, but you know, more often than not, no. Don't give up. Keep trying to honor God and express and reflect who he is. You never know what God's doing with that. And on the day Christ returns, won't it be great uh, to be able to see some of those results? And Paul kind of goes in that direction in verse 17, and that's probably where we'll wrap for today. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. And none of us here has probably ever given a drink offering. Um, you know, that was part of the worship style of not just the Old Testament believers, but it was also kind of common in a lot of the pagan religions. But the idea is just what it sounds like. You take something of uh, liquid form and probably the best of the best wine or grapes or whatever, and you'd pour it on the altar. And let me just ask you, when you pour it on the altar, what happens to it? It runs away and disappears. That's the image. Even if I'm being poured out and to me it looks like it's all running away and disappearing, it's okay. That's the idea behind this that Paul's expressing. Because it's not about perfection, but presence. I'm doing it because God matters, and he'll work with that. Yeah. Sometimes we forget what God is doing with us at that time. Oh, yeah. Look at the outward, like, there ain't anything happening, Lord. Like, that person there is. <laughs> like, God's got some things going on, and it's not changing anything. And when we say, you know, it's taking me, and it's changing me. God is working on me as opposed to me looking at Bob and Bill over there. Yep. And what you've just described is humility, isn't it? And that's what the chapter's getting at as well. When we remember in humility that this situation also is God working on me. Not just me being all that and saving everybody else. That doesn't happen anyway, does it? So yeah, remembering that with humility is a big, big part of it too. Um, and so this is the last verse before the break in the paragraph. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. And it kind of sums up what we've been talking about, just the confidence and the hope that we have because God is at work, period. And that's really where Paul's going throughout chapters 1 and this part of chapter 2. He'll get into some other examples of putting that into practice through chapter the end of chapter 2 and chapter 3. And what he's really going to start emphasizing now for the people in Philippi is remember whose you are. You are citizens of an eternal kingdom, an eternal home that cannot be shaken. And one of the reasons he went that way in Philippi is because, I think I shared with you last week, Philippi originally was a gold mining town, became very, very affluent. It was under Alexander the Great's father, Philip, who named it Philippi after himself. Uh, but then after a couple hundred years, the gold ran out and it became almost a ghost town. And then it's at right at the top of the Aegean Sea between what we would think of as Greece and Turkey, or backwards for you, Greece and Turkey. Um, and uh, on the Ignatian Way, the main travel route from Italy and Rome and Greece all the way to Asia, uh, that still exists in many places today and is still used in many places today. Uh, so this ghost town then became the battle site um, for... Uh, um, where Brutus rebelled against Caesar, and you know, you've got you know, Shakespeare, A2 Brutus, and all that, uh, based on that, that battle. And when the, those fighting against Caesar were defeated, Philippi was rewarded by being made a Roman colony. So this once affluent place that became a ghost town was now a Roman colony and kind of a retirement center for soldiers. And so citizenship, they were all made suddenly citizens of Rome and had a whole lot of rights and privileges. And so Paul's going to remind them, you think that's good? Let me tell you about a citizenship that's eternal. And, and again, for you and I who live in a pretty comfortable, pretty affluent, pretty stable part of the world, that's a good reminder too. Uh, that what we often base our lives upon and think we're controlling, and you know, COVID reminded us how little we control in a lot of ways, uh, we have a citizenship that's eternal and lasting and is solid no matter what. And so we can take something out of that for the next couple of weeks too. Um, all right, let's close there with prayer for today. 
Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We trust in you and, and we remember that you are unchanging in your desire, in your goodness toward us, in your faithfulness toward us. Yet, uh, because we live in a world that's so impacted by sin, that trust is often um, shaken, sometimes shaken very hard. We pray that you'd help us to remember again that nothing has changed your character and nature, uh, that your salvation is real, uh, and that we are best off when we keep you front and center in our lives, remembering how you showed your goodness to us through Jesus, your Son. So help us to have his mind in us, the mind that you've given us, that sees others as of such great value to you as well. Uh, and then help us to be people who try to reflect who you are. We pray it in our Savior's name. <coughs> Amen. All right, we'll pick up next time. Sister Kendra. And we're the creators of Ryan DeFrady's Secret Agents. Ryan is a secret agent, skillful. No, he mostly wants to go it alone. But soon he'll find he cannot make it on his own. I created the character of Ryan when I was a kid's pastor in Kentucky and wanted to introduce spiritual truths in a fun way. 
I've now been in children's ministry for 10 years, and I've seen how media can influence kids for good and for bad. I'm also a father of two. As a dad, I see firsthand the need for quality, wholesome entertainment the whole family can enjoy. Right, but sadly, there just aren't a whole lot of good examples out there, and that's why American Family Studios wanted to get involved. American Family Studios is a ministry dedicated to creating content that uplifts, inspires, and encourages. I've been working for them for over seven years as a screenwriter because I believe that the power of storytelling is huge and helps us to be able to spread the love of Jesus. Ryan DeFrady's Secret Agent introduces important life lessons in a fun, exciting way so that kids don't even realize they're learning. We have a granny with this exploding hot sauce and this giant 20 foot tall mechanical cow and all kinds of crazy villains that will be sure to keep your family laughing for years to come. But more importantly, the life lessons that they're learning will sink deep down into them. We had a ton of fun writing it. We think your family's gonna enjoy it. So follow us for more information from American Family Studios on Ryan DeFrady's Secret Agent. Yeah.